Okay. So welcome to Content Security Policy. Um, quick introduction in the beginning. My name is Arne Blankwitz. I'm a consultant from Germany working for a company called the PHP Consulting Company, which obviously gives it away that we are a PHP related or very close to PHP um, kind of company. And um, since I'm the security paranoid of this company, um, I'm the guy telling everybody how to make stuff in a secure way. And recently, um, I'm in the happy position that got a few of the standard problems um, have a chance of actually finally going away by adhering to new standards, which this presentation is about. So, content security policy is something um, actually originally Mozilla invented, and today is basically pushing forward together with the um, Chrome development team from Google. So it's a relatively open source thing, relatively because it's um, it strives to be a W3C standard, which by definition is sort of open source, but of course it's a committee thing, so it's not really everybody can push something and we can see whatever happens really soon. It's a project and it's a long-term thing that might take some time to actually you know, be implemented on all edges. So for everybody who's not necessarily extremely familiar with all the details what cross-thread scripting can always be, I'm just going to run down a few simple examples. So one thing, and I'm not sure why this is not formatted. Let me quickly check that if I can fix this. Real quick, hold on. Might make it a bit nicer to view. Haha, -ha, it works. Amazing, if you do things properly, they actually tend to work. And then we had actually highlighted code. All working? Sorry. Yeah, I just managed to mess up my slide that the highlighting didn't work. Okay, so this is, of course, the most simple example of doing it wrong. Um, simply outputting whatever kind of um, input you get from the outside will basically allow an attacker to pretty much control the output HTML, which is the definition of cross-site scripting. And despite the fact this is technically a problem on the server side, it's the client side that's suffering, and the Mozilla and Google people figured um, this is a really, really old problem, and if you check into the OVASP as the, the standard thing, they have a top 10 list of all the common issues that's relatively high in the list and it keeps being there for like a really long time. So despite all the education to backend developers, nobody seems to be able to actually fix this. So the idea was, okay, let's try to mitigate the problem on the browser, which is actually the affected platform for it. So this is one problem they have to deal with. Because if you send it like this, what the outputting result will be like this. So you actually directly have the script code in here and it's going to be executed. In this case, it's just going to show an annoying alert, but of course that's just a tiny detail. So that's the standard fail. The problem with that is that you can do a lot more with this approach and with this particular type of problem. You don't necessarily even need a server. You can, of course, simply use JavaScript only stuff and then have it generate whatever kind of bizarre output by simply modifying um, this property you're going to add whatever kind of thing you had somewhere so you can directly inject HTML code into the page which may be desired but may also be of course a real big problem. And you can 
of course, add stuff to handles and have them do something. So even if you are not capable of executing code directly, you can have it in a way like this. So this obviously will not work because this file is not likely to exist. So the error handler is going to be invoked. And you can um, forward information, which is really interesting because quite many people believe that there's not really something you can do unless you can submit a form and send it to somewhere because the standard AJAX stuff doesn't work on cross-domain. But simply creating a new image and not even showing it, but simply using a SRC property to actually send out a request, all the data that's going to add to the URL here is simply going to be forwarded. So the attacker is going to get the information. Of course, there's not really an image that's going to be shown because it's not going to be added to the page to begin with, but the request is out, so the data is lost, and it's been forwarded. You can, of course, also forward the session ID, which might be helpful. Really bad situation to be in, actually, having the cookies being forwarded like this, but OK. So of course. The main question is what can be done, and of course the standard answer is, well, fix your code on the server side, right? But since we are now on the browser part, um, well, let's see what we can potentially do. And what we can potentially make sure is that if we don't have a means of touching the actual application, we may have means of modifying how headers are being sent. So configuring our PHP environment to actually set that the, at least the session cookie is going to be HTTP only, makes it impossible for the previous attack with sending the document cookies work. It's going to stop working because the cookie, by definition, is not available for JavaScript. It's still within the browser, of course. The browser is going to send it around. But the browser knows, OK, it's HTTP only, so it, it's a transport thing only. It means we are not going to have it added in the JavaScript environment. It also means, of course, you cannot read it from the JavaScript environment, but why would you need to read the session cookie to begin with? It should be a communication thing between you and the browser, and no need for JavaScript to actually read it. So that will fix that part. It basically makes that this additional thing is being added. If you're in a secure environment, as in having HTTPS, then it's going to be secure only as well on top of that to make sure that it's only going to be transported when it's in SSH context, so in a secure and encrypted context. You can, of course, do that with uh, custom cookies if you have your own cookies that you need to be sending around for whatever reason, and if you're knowing that your JavaScript application part does not need access to it, then, of course, we can add that as a parameter as well. But the better idea and the more generic approach to all kinds of problems, because what I just did with like the additional configuration, as good as it is, is only going to deal with the cookie part. So it's not going to save me for all the other attack vectors and all the other potential problems. So the better approach and the more efficient approach to, to the whole thing is content security policy. And the basic idea of content security policies as Mozilla came up with it in a really early on specification, and by now they reached version two of that, or almost reached it, um, is to make sure that basically we don't allow any scripting, we don't allow any connectivity, we definitely dis disable everything. And it's up to the header being specified, telling, okay, after you requested the plain HTML part, we can tell you alongside what you actually are supposed to be requesting, where you're going to load stuff from, and how it's supposed to look like. So it's a whitelist approach. By definition, everything is disabled unless you explicitly enable it, which makes it really feel like you're back in the old days, in like the really beginning of the internet, because that's plain HTML. There's no CSS, there's no images, there's nothing unless you deliberately enable it, which can get a really pretty bad looking page. It's just plain text. So we have a bunch of directives in the version one. Basically, the first one that for everybody who's actually doing anything active on the browser level is going to be script SRC. Basically, allows this is the address list or the pattern of where scripts can be loaded. Anything needs to be defined, as I said. By default, there's none. So you're not going to have any scripts executed, and the browser is not going to request any. If you do a bit more of more modern stuff, you might actually have a callback using WebSockets in a really modern way or classical XML HTTP request as in the AJAX thing. And then you're going to have to tell it, OK, you can actually connect back to this. So this is a connect SRC. 
If you want to load images, which I presume everybody feels like doing, then you're going to have to define the, the address pattern. Of course, you don't have to name every single image, but you have to name the host and the definition for it. We're going to look at how the rules look like in a bit. Same thing goes for styles. Every CSS is going to be exclusively mentioned. That also means that if you have a script source creating a new link for stylesheet and edit, if this is a URL in there, it's not mentioned in the style sheet, it's not going to be loaded. You allowed the script to be executed, but hey, why does the script have the means to load anything else? Unless the URLs you have in there are listed, it's not going to work, it's not going to happen. So this may actually be really quite recursive. I've been told that some people use frames, but basically the majority probably use iframes these days. Of course, also, there's something that's going to be loading from somewhere, so you have to tell it, okay, on this particular page request, this is what I allow from an iframe source. Any kind of media stuff, audio video stuff, particularly interesting for the HTML5 video playing stuff, if there's a URL in there, the media source has to be specified. If you want to be even more fancy in design, you're going to have your own fonts, no matter what format they are. If it's a font that's been loaded by CSS and the font SRC is not listed, you're not going to see that font happening. And if you still use any kind of plugins, you have uh, object SRC. So this is where any kind of data that's supposed to be executed or being integrated by a plugin, that's where you want to go for. And if you forgot anything and you want to define anything, there's a default SRC, which is the default rule, okay, Everything that I didn't specify here, this rule should apply. And we have another feature which is called Sandbox, which is basically the part that work, deals with iframes and frames, which is pretty much the one that, well, at least Microsoft never really bothered to fully implement, so this is a bit of a quirky thing. And since the majority of you don't really use iframes that much anymore, I don't think that's a really important issue anyway. Okay, and really important to understand what actually is happening is the report URI, which is not actually a really security directive per se, but as the name already suggests, that's where reports are going to be sent to. So if any of those directions that you specified here is going to be violated, the browser can, if this thing is set, send you a report. Like, hey, somebody on this URL using this particular browser and another different set of information, we're going to have a look at that in detail in a bit, is going to be forwarded and you can see, okay, this didn't work for whatever reason that is. And you can decide whether or not it's actually a problem or it shows that there's a security problem um, that you have to deal with. As I already mentioned, there's a version 2 in the making. The interesting thing is that version 1 has been implemented by quite many browsers without actually being an official standard. It always was a working draft at the W3C. The version 2 is actually by now uh, candidate recommendation, so it's quite close to being an official, fully qualified and finalized standard. The um, GitHub repository where this standard is being developed has like roughly 70 tickets open, um, with quite many of them being marked as for version 3, so I'm quite sure it's going to be really, really soon that we have this as an official finalized standard. And more and more browsers are already picking up the majority of those new things. So the new thing well, one of the new things is the base URI. Some people might remember that from having it as a header in the HTML block that you can set this the base URI for all this stuff. That's going to be relative. You can do that here as well, which basically avoids copy-pasting the same part everywhere, just shortening it a lot. Well, they removed the frame thing because they realized that it actually doesn't really make any sense the way they implemented it and the way it works. They decided to make it different and call it child SRC because from a page perspective, a child is everything that runs well off of it in a way, and an iframe is just a child as well. So they just removed the duplication. And with the child SRC, you have all the web worker stuff. That's a new fancy HTML, uh, JavaScript, ES6, and on stuff um, where you can actually do a lot of additional things that you couldn't be, do it before. But of course, there's also stuff that is a child thing that's running within the browser, so that's following into the same group of things. We have another thing that I think is really nice. They added form action. So all the forms that you have on your, um, on your HTML page, 
can now be mentioned as well. So if somebody tries to add a form by whatever JavaScript means and you forgot to make that secure, they cannot submit the form to the URL unless the form action URL is listed here. Really practical thing. Um, then we have frame ancestors, which is basically the same thing as you had with the X frame option that Microsoft invented some years ago. Um, basically it tells like, okay, if my page is loaded as an iframe and the parent is not what I actually allow in this list, then it's not going to be executed. So that's the same thing as the frame options, making sure that I can control where I'm going to be embedded in, which is a really important thing if you want to fight necessary cross-site scripting, but um, the click checking thing where you basically have um, two layers of things, because if you Let's just say this is the, the, the center web page and just fold it backwards and see the layers like this, right? So this is the background you have. Then you have a form, which you set to 100% transparency, and then you put a button on top of it. Then the button is on top, but if you revert that and put the 100% transparent iframe on top and then have the button below it, you can still want to see the button. It's the same thing from a visual perspective, but of course from a code perspective, it's completely different. So the click checking approach would be to put the iframe in a way so that the button in the iframe that you can't see because it's transparent is triggering whatever action and you believe to actually press the button that's way below. Well, if you control the frame ancestors or the X frame options header, then you can specify like, I'm not going to allow anybody but my own to actually be part of the outer stuff. So my iframe is not going to be loaded and it's not going to be executed and the attack vector just died which is a cool thing. Then we can, with version 2, um, be very strict about what the stuff, you remember, uh, what, what plugins to execute, remember the, um, the object SRC from version 1, where you can specify, okay, those are sources, but now you can also restrict the type of what you actually want to allow. This is just the MIME media type that you want to specify. So if you say, okay, on this particular page, I'm only going to allow Flash as a plugin, well, then you can just use that media type and everything else in terms of plugins is never going to work. May not be really that important anymore, seeing that the majority of browser vendors try to remove all kinds of plugin APIs and be really strict about that. But for now, it's still there, so I think it makes sense to be added. So all those things require rules. All the direction, except for the report UI, which is a bit different, everything has rules. And the default rule is none. So we don't allow anything. So if you say Im image SRC none, means you're not going to have any images. Self is the magic thing from, okay, from this particular host. So it basically allows you to load everything that's coming from the same domain. From a given host name, no matter what protocol, or some part of the domain, and then having host names up front as you feel like, or including the protocol, which is really important if you want to make sure that, okay, we're not going to allow anybody to even try to load HTTP stuff when we're in HTTPS context. So particularly this way. You can allow data URLs specifically, so if you believe that embedding stuff as a data URL within a CSS is going to help you, no, it's not. It actually has to be enabled explicitly. We have the sandboxed iframe stuff that I mentioned earlier, um, where you can specify a few additional things. Again, Internet Explorer, starting at il version 11, I believe, starts to support this. Before that, they didn't really care, in case somebody still cares about that old version of it anyway. Um, it basically means that you can specify what this particular iframe can do um, if you move your mouse over it. So pointer lock would be that you cannot change the pointer. I mean, there's a CSS event that you can set if you move over it, that pointer will change. You can lock this from happening within the iframe. Um, you can allow pop-ups or not. Obviously, steps XMOT, I think, same origin is the same thing. Again, you can um, allow communication and you can disable then the top navigation stuff, as in saying in JavaScript, one second, um, saying, okay, whatever, um, top.location.href equals whatever, and then overwriting the parent URL. If you say, this is not allowed, 
by default. If you enable it, then you can actually do it. Yes. Yes. It's exactly what you have right now. As in the take the full URL of the page you're looking at and remove everything that's URL specific and just take the hostname protocol, everything on that part. Just the like the path is removed, but everything else that's the self. The URL that is that far is the same. Yeah. Okay. okay. I already mentioned frame ancestors versus X frame options, just to repeat that. Um, of course, the, the, the names and the, the um, values translate, but a little bit different. So if you used X frame options deny, and you want to use the frame ancestors now, it's going to be non. And if it's same origin for X frame options, then in CSP speak, that's going to be self. And of course, since now we have two means of specifying it, you might actually run into a conflict saying, okay, we say this non, but in here we say the same origin. So what the hell do we do now? Well, the cool thing is somebody figured that out might be a problem and, well, decided, okay, you know what? CSP is newer, so it's going to obsolete whatever X frame options is being said. So if you specify frame ancestors, then it's going to overrule whatever X frame options is said to be. We have a few other things in CSP 2.0 that are interesting and worth mentioning. One thing that I like very much is a JavaScript way of actually realizing that something didn't work out. In version 1, the browser simply refused to do it, and nobody knew it unless you actually looked into console and see the report message saying that it blocked something. But you cannot really programmatically react to that situation. With version 2, you have deliberately created an event for that, which basically equals close to the report. So you can see, okay, something happened, something got just refused, and you can at least inform the user, like, hey, whatever just happened, you probably just found a bug because that shouldn't have happened, but at least we know that's not working for a reason and not just magically stopped working. Um, you can send an additional header from the client to the server to signal it actually understands what content security policy is about. So this is more like an informative thing that the code on the server can react to it. And something that's really cool, um, basically inspired by SRE, the sub-resource integrity movement that's also a working draft at the WSOC, when I have it in a look in a, in a bit, they added nonce and hash support to the script and style SRC, which means you have an additional header part like this saying, okay, if it's a script, it has to match this thing. And if it doesn't work together, it's not going to use that. So the header can control what the browser is going to see and going to do with it. Nonce is a bit complicated. I think hashes is easier to understand. So let's just look at this. It's pretty much the same idea, though. You have a head specification, so any script that it will be loaded and uh, complies to this particular hash as a result will be executed. So if this script would be this hash, well, it should, so it can never be, but assuming it would be, um, then the script would be accepted. That's really helpful, particularly if you load stuff from um, CDNs, like for example, you are a jQuery user and you use the jQuery CDN for it. Well, just look at the hash from that particular version that you're using add that to the headers, and even if you load this from the CDN, nobody can actually modify that particular released version anymore because you have a hash and you can verify that this particular code matches to that particular hash. So that's really cool. And it's exactly the same thing that the um, sub-resource integrity movement, as a working draft at the WSRC, is trying to do. They, of course, have a different tag for it or a different attribute. So I'm really curious who's going to win this. Um, but it has basically the SRC where you get it, and you have an integrity thing, so it's going to add that on top of it. So this is inside the HTML. It's not necessarily exactly the same thing as the header, but it comes really close, and it's the same logical approach to it. So 
as cool as this all may be, um, how can I use it and how much can I trust this? And if you check the canIuse.com site for content security policy, this is the list roughly that you get from it. So every browser starting Firefox 4 is supporting it, which is not very surprising because Mozilla invented it. Bless you. Um, we have Chrome starting version 14, which is probably old enough as well for everybody to be, have surpassed that by now. Um, even if somebody is still using Safari, um, well, starting with version 6, you have that, even on iOS. Opera has that, well, now even more since they swapped out their own engine, but still it's supported. Various Android browser versions have that, so it's pretty much everybody except for older Internet Explorer versions. So starting with version 10, we have basic support. With 11, you even have more sandbox support included. I actually have no real knowledge of how Microsoft continues or plans to continue Internet Explorer support since they have the Edge browser, as they call the new thing they are working on. Um, this is definitely destined to have CSP 2.0 support um, by the time it's finished, at least. Um, they have a lot of version 1 stuff down, so I'm quite sure they're going to enhance the rest. It's not that big of a change once it's being implemented properly in the engine. Okay, so how does this look back to our original example? So we remember the introduction with the really bad echo thing where we have this as an output as a result because of the GET request where the parameter was directly outputted. The main difference is now that we actually have the header and we say script SRC means self. So everything that's being loaded as an additional script element that has a source attribute set and requests the script additionally is going to be allowed. Everything else is not, not. So that means this script, it's in line, it's not going to be used, it's not going to work, and it's not actually being executed. But of course you're going to see this if you look into a debugging console because that's the method you're going to get. And with that, we basically fix cross-site scripting because the majority of attacks are based on exactly like this type of approach. I'm going to inject code and try to make it inline. That's not going to work. Making it a data URL doesn't work. Loading it from an external site doesn't work. The only way it would work is if I find a way to load it from the own, my own site. So if it would be an upload that I could put as a file and then refer to it without actually being checked, well, then it might work again, but that's already a different security issue to begin with. So all cool, we're done. Yeah? Is there a way to enable the live streams? Yes. Just to repeat the question, if there's a way to enable inline scripting, yes, there is, but you don't want this because that kills the basic idea of content security policy. We're going to see how we can work around that in a minute because that also means that all the classical stuff, on mouse over, on click, whatever, like direct attributes, not the event. The event is still there. Just the HTML inline code is not working anymore. We don't have any eval anymore, which may be a good or a bad thing, depending on whom you ask. And we don't have any inline variable definition, which is the main reason people today still use inline um, scripting, particularly if you have like all kinds of ad tags. You basically have a, whatever generic loader being requested as an external script, but they have the spot where you want to have it and then have a definition of a variable set up here. That's the configuration, basically. So that's all not working anymore, at least not as it used to be. So we're back to square one. No, we're not. It's not that bad, luckily. Um, there's a clean way to add event handlers, but because if you actually use scripts, then simply adding an event listener is exactly the clean way of doing it, and that's the script-only approach. And it's a lot cleaner, because even if you think you originally needed to be able to have the on-click attribute set in the HTML, it's actually a violation of separations of concerns because you are actually adding scripting and program stuff into the markup of the page, which is not supposed to be that way. Having an element with an ID that you can refer to and then add whatever kind of behavior to it, that makes a lot of sense, but that's a